kaartjes. मंच की शोभा का अभिनंदन ले मंच पर उपस्थित विद्वान इस सत्र के अध्यक्ष इस संस्थान के सर्वे सर्वार प्रोफेसर मुजफ्फर अहमद भट्ट साहब मंच पर उपस्थित सज्जार अहमद दर साहब अब्दुल मजीद साहब अहमद सलमान दर साहब शौकत साहब डॉक्टर गुलाम साहब डॉक्टर रईस साहब डॉक्टर सलमान दर साहब एवं हायाकार गण इस सत्र के डॉक्टर जहूर जहूर अहमद वानी साहब डॉक्टर सब्जार अहमद वानी साहब एवं जिनका नाम नहीं जानता उपस्थित उपस्थित इस सभा का प्रिय छात्रों प्यारे छात्राओं और भी सुधारती नगर से पत्थरे हुए विद्वजन जैसा कि मेरा जैसे विज्ञान जो है विज्ञान के अनेक प्रकार है जैसे जीव विज्ञान वनस्पति विज्ञान एनिजोलॉजी बाटनी रसायन विज्ञान केमिस्ट्री भौतिक विज्ञान फिजिक्स खगोल विज्ञान जियोग्राफी विज्ञान में आता है आर्ट में भी आता है और साइंस में भी आता है और भूगोल का एरिया जो है थोड़ा ज्यादा ही है अन्य विज्ञान तो इस दृष्टि से इसमें देसी भाषाओं की क्या भूमिका हो सकती है जो हमारी देसी भाषाएं हैं क्योंकि अधिकतर तो एक फैशन चला है अंग्रेजी में पढ़ने पढ़ाने का अंग्रेजी आवश्यक है इंटरनेशनल स्तर पर संवाद करना है तो आवश्यक है कि जो देसी भाषाएं जैसे बहुत सारे ऐसे शब्द हैं जिसको हमारे बच्चे जानते हैं लेकिन जब हम बड़े होते हैं उस क्षेत्र में नहीं जाते और वे हमारे जो सारे बचपन में जो सुने गए शब्द होते हैं उस पर रिसर्च कार्य नहीं होते जैसे आयुर्वेद को ले लीजिए मेडिकल साइंस को ले लीजिए चंदन शब्द को ले लीजिए तुलसी शब्द को ले लीजिए हल्दी शब्द को ले लीजिए दूध को ले लीजिए मोथा एक शब्द होता है जिसको लगाने से किस पर मुंह पर जो महासे होते हैं वे छूट जाते ऐसे ऐसे काम कोशों में ऐसे ऐसे शब्द हैं जिसके अंग्रेजी नहीं होता तो अगर हम उन भाष देसी भाषाओं को नहीं सीखते हैं कश्मीरी को नहीं सीखते हैं संस्कृत को नहीं सीखते हैं हिंदी को नहीं सीखते हैं तो हम लगभग विज्ञान में साइंस में भरपूर योग नहीं दे सकते क्योंकि जो हमारी इतनी भाषाएं हैं संस्कृत से विकसित हुई है जैसे एक बार मैं जा रहा था बच्चों को पिकनिक लेकर तो वहां देखा कि गाना बोझ रहा था तो मैं उसका धूल बहुत प्यारा लग रहा था तो मैं गीत भी बनाता हूँ तो धुन एन म्यूजिक तो मैंने पूछा कि इसका अर्थ क्या होगा तो बच्चे ने बताया तो मैंने देखा उसमें एक बामनो शब्द और क्या था संस्कृत का जो वायु शब्द है वायु मैंने हवा उसी से उसमें बामनो वो बन गया तो ऐसे संस्कृत के जो शब्द है या संस्कृत भाषा में ऐसे ऐसे शब्द है आयुर्वेद के क्षेत्र में विज्ञान के क्षेत्र में परमाणु शब्द चलता है अन्न सबसे छोटे कर्ण परमाणु इलेक्ट्रॉन प्रोट्रॉन न्यूट्रॉन परमाणु शब्द का जिक्र महर्षि कणाक ने किया है प्रचीन का इसलिए अंग्रेजी सीखना वो बुरी बात नहीं है कि उसके साथ साथ हम देसी भाषाओं को भी सीखें और उसमें जितने भी प्रकार के शब्द हैं उन शब्दों के पीछे हम रिसर्च कर सकते हैं या उन शब्दों का अंग्रेजी भी बना सकते हैं इससे विज्ञान तो डेवलप होगा ही अंग्रेजी भाषा भी डेवलप होगी और अंग्रेजी भाषाओं में भी शब्दों का हमारा भंडार जो है वह बढ़ जाएगा मेरे कहने का दूसरा पॉइंट यह है कि यानी कहा गया है कि निज भाषा उन्नति है सब उन्नति को मूल यानी अपनी जो भाषा है जैसे हमारे यहाँ जो बच्चे हैं ये हिमालय संस्कृति के जैसे नेपाल होगा बांग्लादेश होगा भारत अफगानिस्तान यहाँ तक जो हिमालय संस्कृति है हिमालय संस्कृति के जितने भी देश हैं तो हिमालय संस्कृति के जितने भी बच्चे हैं अगर हम अपने शब्दों को सीखते हैं तो उन शब्दों के द्वारा हम लोग बहुत कुछ खगोल विज्ञान के क्षेत्र में भी योगदान दे सकते हैं रसायन विज्ञान चिकित्सा शास्त्र के क्षेत्र में भी योगदान दे सकते हैं प्राचीन वैज्ञानिकों के संदर्भ में भी कुछ अता पता कर सकते हैं जैसे हमारे यहाँ प्राचीन वैज्ञानिक हो चुके हैं प्राचीन काल में हो चुके हैं क्योंकि तो यहाँ पर देखेंगे आप आचार्य आते हैं वे नाटक में भी यानी सिनेमा जब पढ़ेंगे आप तो भी उनकी चर्चा हम करते हैं जब कविता पढ़ते हैं तो भी आचार्य अभिनवगुप्त आते हैं जब हम साहित्य पढ़ते हैं कवि भी थे कवि भी थे और कृतिक भी थे दोनों थे सौंदर्य शास्त्री सौंदर्य शास्त्री भी थे 
और इसके अतिरिक्त उन्होंने विज्ञान के सूत्रों पर बहुत सा संकेत दिया है उनकी एक पुस्तक है तंत्रालोक तंत्र यानी जैसे यंत्र आजकल चलता है यंत्र सभ्यता वैसे पहले प्राचीन काल में तंत्र सभ्यता चलती थी और अभिनव गुप्त एक ऐसे आचार्य थे जिन्होंने विभिन्न गुरुओं से पढ़ी थी यानी जो सिनेमा का स्पेशलिस्ट था उसे सिनेमा के बारे में पढ़ा था उन्होंने पिता दिवासव भटेंदुराज नाम के गुरु थे और कविता के बारे में जिन गुरुओं से पढ़ी थी उनके बारे में चर्चा करते हैं विज्ञान के बारे में जो जो सूत्र है यानी बहुत सारे ऐसे सूत्र छोड़ते हैं साइंस क्या है यदि हम कल्पना करना छोड़ दे कल्पना जैसे कलाम साहब थे तो क्या वे सोचते थे कि जो है सीरियल में सीरियल देखते हैं सीरियल कल्पनिक ही हो लेकिन मान की कल्पना है लेकिन कल्पना हम सीख सकते जैसे तीर जाता है और तीर लगता है फिर वापस आ जाता है ऐसे ऐसे हम यंत्रों का आविष्कार कर सकते हैं सूर्य को देखते हैं चांद को देखते हैं तो चांद किरणों को किस प्रकार से इकट्ठा किया जा सकता है सूर्य किरणों को किस प्रकार से इकट्ठा किया जा सकता है हवा जो है हवा पर हम रिसर्च कर सकते हैं समुद्र पर रिसर्च कर सकते हैं एक बार सुनामी लहर आई थी बहुत पहले तो अमेरिका बहुत सारे यंत्र थे पहले से जो बता सकते थे लेकिन वे बता नहीं पाए बाद में रिसर्च हुआ तो बताया गया कि जो हाथी होते हैं हाथी तो अपने स्थान छोड़कर वहां से चले गए यानी हाथियों को पता था कि कोई ना कोई विपत्ति आने वाली है कोई ना कोई आपदा आने वाली है कोई ना कोई संकट आने वाला है यानी जो हमारे पशु पक्षी है जीव जानवर है उनको पता था सुनामी लहर के बारे में तो मेरे कहने का अर्थ है यदि हम संस्कृत को सीखते हैं हिंदी को सीखते हैं कश्मीरी भाषा को सीखते हैं पंजाबी भाषा को सीखते हैं जितने भी हिमालय संस्कृति की भाषाएं उनको सीखते हैं इसे हम साइंस के क्षेत्र में भरपूर सहयोग दे सकते हैं इसलिए जो हमारी भाषाएं हैं केवल अंग्रेजी में क्या है अंग्रेजी में यह कि एक लकीर का प्रति जिन विषयों पर रिसर्च हुआ है या हो रहा है उसी पीछे हम पढ़ते हैं लेकिन यदि हम अपनी भाषा को सीखते हैं देशी भाषा को सीखते हैं लोक को सीखते हैं लोक भी बहुत बड़ा प्रमाण है क्योंकि तो लोक में ऐसे ऐसे शब्द हैं ऐसे ऐसे विज्ञान के तत्व हैं जिसके आधार पर हम रिसर्च कर सकते हैं इसके अतिरिक्त जो हमारे प्राचीन काल के वैज्ञानिक हैं अगस्त मुनि हुए हुआ करते थे बहुत पहले उनका नाम था महर्षि अगस्त अगस्त के बारे में कहा जाता है कि समतलित करण करने का यानी जमीन को बराबर करने का उनके पास इसकी विद्या थी महर्षि भारद्वाज विमान शास्त्र था विमान बनाने के लिए एरोप्लेन बनाने की कला उनके पास थी तो ऐसे ऐसे बहुत सारे ग्रंथ हैं जिनके बारे में हम नहीं जानते हैं उन ग्रंथों को अगर आपको जानना है विमान बनाने की प्राचीन कला क्या थी आयुर्वेद की प्राचीन कला क्या थी चिकित्सा शास्त्र की प्राचीन सर्जरी चिकित्सा क्या है चरक सुश्रुत धनवंतर बहुत से ऐसे आचार्य हो चुके थे जिनके बारे में हम सीख सकते हैं अगर प्राचीन ज्ञान को लेना है या अपने विज्ञान को डेवलप करना है इसके लिए हम फिर से परंपरा की ओर लौटना पड़ेगा जैसे दोनों पैर हम लोग आसमान में फेंक देंगे तो गिर पड़ेंगे दोनों पैर जमीन पर रखेंगे तो जहां रहेंगे वहीं पर रहेंगे एक पैर जो है आधुनिकता के घेरे में होनी चाहिए और एक परंपरा की धरती पर होने चाहिए यानी समन्वय करके समन्वय ही जीवन है जब तक समन्वय नहीं होगा तब तक कुछ भी संगम नहीं है विचारधाराओं में समन्वय सम इसी को बुद्ध ने कहा था सम्यक वचन यानी सम समानता कबीर की भाषा है कि अतिका भला न बोलना अति की भली न चूक यानी अतिका भला न बरसना अति की भली न झूक तो समन्वय ही जीवन है विज्ञान का मतलब ये नहीं केवल मॉडर्निटी मॉडर्निटी हम परंपरा से बहुत कुछ सीख सकते हैं सूत्रों को ले सकते हैं और उसके द्वारा देशी भाषाओं का अध्ययन कर सकते हैं देशी भाषाओं में ऐसे बहुत सारे शब्द हैं जिसे हमारे बच्चे परिचित हैं जिसे हमारे वृद्ध लोग परिचित हैं जिसे हमारा लोग परिचित है लेकिन उसे हमारा साइंस नहीं परिचित क्योंकि साइंस में केवल हम विज्ञान में चिंतन करते हैं जब विज्ञान में चिंतन करते हैं तो एक रास्ता बन जाते हैं एक मार्ग बन जाता है इसलिए यदि इस एक रास्ता को तोड़ना है विज्ञान को भी समृद्ध करना है और अंग्रेजी भाषा भी समृद्ध होगी क्योंकि उन शब्दों का अंग्रेजी अभी तक नहीं है जैसे पानी शब्द है पानी शब्द का सामान्य अर्थ क्या होता है वाटर वाटर का सामान्य अर्थ होता है पानी हाथ धोने वाला लेकिन जल शब्द है संस्कृत भाषा का तो जल मतलब जिससे जिस जीवन जन्म लेता है और जिसके बिना लव मतलब जीवन जो है मृत में लीन हो जाता है संस्कृत के शब्द थोड़ा दूसरे स्ट्रक्चर में आते हैं जैसे अंग्रेजी में है म्यूजिक तो म्यूजिक मतलब केवल गाना बजाने लेकिन संगीत में क्या होता है जहाँ पर बजाया भी जाए गाया भी जाए और नाचा भी जाए गीतम बाद्यो संगीतम चौ उच्चते अच्छा सरंगधर हुए हैं संगीत रचना कर एक पुस्तक है उसमें उन्होंने इस, इसके बारे में डिटेल से व्याख्या की है उसका उल्लेख किया है तो मित्रों में अंत अंत अपने वाणी को विराम देना चाहता हूँ आप लोगों ने जो भी समझा मुझे बुलाया बोलने का अवसर दिया इसके लिए मैं हृदय से कृतज्ञता ज्ञापन करता हूँ धन्यवाद नमस्कार Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Dr. Patak, sir, for such an outstanding and illuminating lecture. 
Dr. Parikh Sir's talk has added diversity and different flavor to this conference. I would love to hear more from you, sir. We will definitely invite you in future also. Our second speaker of this segment is Dr. Ghulam Hassan Dar, Assistant Professor, SP College, Cluster University, Senate. Dr. Hassan did his PhD from prestigious institute CCMB Hyderabad. He did his postdoc from University of Oxford. His cutting edge research has been published in reputed international journals like Nature Communications, which has an impact factor of 18. Please welcome Dr. Hassan. Okay. Uh, 
So, uh, now this, this type of communication is really quick, yeah. but it is transient in nature, so as soon as the signal is gone, the response is gone. So we have the second type of communication that's working in our cell, that we call as endocrinology. So in this system, we have hormones driven by the cells. I can give the example again. So yeah, whenever we take a meal, like you know, food or something, our pancreas gets a signal, it secretes a hormone which we call as insulin. So that insulin goes in the blood, and it binds the cells, it tells the cells that there's a food outside waiting for you, please take the food. So that response remains for a long time, but it is slower, it has a much, much longer effect. Now we have another uh, communication going on in the cell that has been recently discovered, but that doesn't mean this uh, response has recently been adopted by the cells. It was there since the creation of this life, but the scientists, you know, they come to know all about this uh, new level of communication recently. So today I will just introduce you about this communication. Now this communication is called extracellular vesicles, so communication. So what's happening, if you, if you just focus on this figure, so a cell, it just synthesizes the lipid vesicles. I think most of you have heard about the liposomes, so they are just like a liposome. So in those lipid vesicles, what's happening, they just uh, put all kind of information in those lipid vesicles. So for example, proteins, nucleic acids, DNA, you know, and the lipids. And then they spread these, these uh, lipid vesicles outside, and then these vesicles, which you can see here, they can be called as exosomes or micro vesicles. So they are taken up by the neighboring cells, and by this way, the neighboring cells can sense what the other cells can do. These vesicles, they can also be taken in the blood, and the blood will take the form and they can have a communication as well. Now, this, uh, you know, new type of communication has been discovered. There was a scientist uh, whose name is Professor Philip uh, Stahl. He was working at the University of Washington. So at that time, he was interested to understand what happens when the red blood cells, they mature from the erythroblasts. So we all know that the RBC are a special type of cell which lack nucleus. They lack other organelles as, uh, as well. So these RBC, when they mature from this uh, erythroblast, sorry, there's no pointer, so I have just moved myself. Yeah. So these are RBC, they, they just mature from this stage. So when they mature, what happens, they lose all of these organelles. Now the question that can come in the mind, how this cell is losing its organelles? Whether it is, you know, I mean, uh, degrading them inside, or whether it is just throwing them outside. So he was interested in that work. So what he did at that time, he just thought that I would study one protein that we call as the uh, transferrin protein. Now transferrin is a special protein that binds iron. It carries iron from our body to our different parts. So what happened at that time when he was doing the experiment, he labeled the uh, transferrin with an antibody. So that antibody he labeled with the gold nanoparticles. And then they saw the cells under transmission electron microscopy. They got very surprised when they see that there was a huge vesicle formed inside the cells. And these vesicles, they can make small vesicles inside them. And in one of the pictures they have seen, as you can see the right side of the picture, one of the big vesicles, it has fused with the cell membrane and it is releasing all of these small vesicles outside. So from this experiment, they just kept in one new form of uh, cellular communication. So what they are saying that the cell is packing the transferring receptor in the small vesicles, and then those small vesicles are being you know captured in a bigger vesicle. Then this bigger vesicle it just fused with the cell membrane, and these small vesicles are being secreted. Now. At that time, the people doesn't know what is the function of these vegetables, what they are doing as So most of the scientists, they found that, they thought these are just like a trash bags, you know, because the cell used them as a trash bag, so the cell doesn't need any protein or any organelle, it packs them in these small vesicles, and then the cell can just throw them out. 
But there was a paper in 1996 where the researchers found that there was a B cell, which is an immune cell, that that B cell was secreting these same vesicles, and then these vesicles were able to activate the another immune cell. So this is the, this was the paper where the function of these vesicles has been determined. So for example, the one cell it secretes the vesicles, then it activates the another cell. So uh, when this paper got published, uh, so what happened, there was a tremendous response from the scientists all around the world and then the people began to, you know, focus more on these vegetables. So you can see the number of publications that's going on, it's still going on. So uh, now it has a big family of scientists who are working around the globe and they have their own uh, cell society which is called the ICEF and it has its own international journal, the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. So it has developed as a huge uh, cell, society, uh, cell society. Now, uh, you can see now, uh, you know, after uh, 10 years of research, it has been found that these vesicles, they have a very important role in the cancer, in the brain diseases, in stem cell therapy, and there are many companies already in, you know, going on. For example, there's a one company called the Exosome Diagnostics in USA. So they are using these vesicles, you know, to develop the new types of markers. So that, for example, in cancer, we have a serious issue that when the cancer has, you know, not entered into the third stage, we are not able to find the cancer, you know, whether the cancer has really gone. So we detect the cancer at the third stage. Now the scientists are trying to, you know, see whether these vesicles can be used before because you can get them from the blood samples, from the saliva, from the ear drops. So the scientists are trying to characterize these vesicles so that they can find some markers and they can predict the disease in the patients. So these are really in a hard field. Now there's another company called Evox. It's in the it's in the United Kingdom. So they are using these vesicles actually to deliver drugs. Now this company has been developed by the SAM lab where I was working. So if you see, this is a cartoon diagram of the vesicles. So it is a lipid membrane, you know, just like a liposome, surrounded by a lipid membrane. Now inside of these vesicles, it has the DNA, it has the RNA, it has all kind of proteins which you can see. And one of the important thing about these vesicles, you can express your own protein on these vesicles. So this is the benefit of these vesicles. Now, before going further, I just want to highlight you one important thing that's going on inside our brain. Now, we know that uh, we have a lot of diseases that are associated with the brain. Now, one of the diseases that neurodegenerative disorders, like Alzheimer's disease, there are Parkinson's diseases, there, there are the age-old diseases. We don't have a treatment. Now, we also are suffering with the brain tumors. Now, the brain is a special organ which is creating a lot of problem for us to develop the drug. Now, one of the reasons why, because it, is, it has a special system which you call as blood-brain barrier. Now, what is blood-brain barrier? If you can see the right image here, so there are two diagrams. You can see the left diagram is the structure of the capillary, blood vessel, and blood vessel of the normal tissue and the blood vessel of the brain tissue. Now, if you can see in the normal tissue, they have small gaps between the cells. So these gaps, they allow the small molecules to come out easily. But in the in the capillaries which are going in the brain, you don't have those kind of gaps. So these are highly sealed. They don't allow anything to come out from the blood. That's why if there is any blood flow coming out of the vessel in the brain, we call it a brain hemorrhage. So you know the person has a chance to die. So this blood-brain barrier, it actually, you know, it's a protective layer around our brain. It doesn't allow any molecule to come out of the blood vessels. Now this is the famous experiment uh, which is here, which shows how it is efficient. So they, in this experiment, it was done in 2005. So what they have done, they have used a very small molecule called the histamine. Histamine is the amino acid derived uh, from the histamine. So it is molecular weight is just 110 Dalton. It's a very, very sm much smaller than the paracetamol that we take daily. So they injected, they labeled this histamine with, with a radioactive probe, and they injected that in the mice. So you can see this is the diagram in the mice. So after 30 minutes, they sacrificed the mice to just see what's going on in the mice. So they found that this histamine was present everywhere except in two places, which you can see by yourself. And all the body of this mice is dark, except this region. It is completely white, the brain and the spinal cord. So which means that 
there is something around the brain which is not allowing this small molecule to enter. Now imagine, this is just a very small molecule, much smaller than paracetamol. The brain is not allowing it to come out, the brain capillaries. How it is possible for us to deliver the drugs into the brain? It's a huge problem that we are facing, that drug companies are facing. That's why we have a medicine available. We have all the medicines actually available. But the real issue is how you can deliver the medicine. Now most of the current strategy that you know that the doctors or the other professionals are using, they do the surgery, brain surgery. They remove this uh, skull, then they inject the drug, which is really, really you know, highly invasive, and no one wants to do it. So you have to find some alternative methods where you can deliver the drug through other ways, the simplest ways through the intravenous injection. Now, the, the strategy that we have developed as a, you know, the molecular biologist is, is just like a Trojan horse. I think most of you may have uh, watched the movie called Troy. You know, so it's, it's a Greek mythology. So what actually they have done, if people have already watched it so they can understand it. So this is the actually Greek mythology, basically what uh, they are doing. Inside of this horse, it was told that there were the soldiers inside it. So, you know, it looks like they are the deity for them as, a, you know, idol worship. So they took this horse inside their campus and it was a long war. So after 10 years they won the war because of this Trojan horse. So it, it befooled the people. They thought it's our own horse, it's a, we can worship it. But inside the horse there were soldiers inside. So when they just enter, uh, opened the gates for the, for the horse, so they just left it inside their own uh, in the yard. So when they went to sleep, and the soldiers come out from the house and they just burn all the steam. Now, same thing, uh, we don't know whether it's true or false, but it is true in the molecular biology. So in the molecular biology, we do the same strategy, and also in the computer, uh, I mean, people who are well-versed with the IT, we also use uh, for the developing the software, particularly the antivirus or virus. So what we are doing, basically, we know the brain also needs some other important molecules which are bigger in size. Like it needs iron, it needs glucose, it needs other proteins. So what the brain has done for them, it has developed special receptors for them. So those receptors, they are on the endothelial cells of the brain capillary. So whenever they find the molecule has come, they bind that receptor and just take it. So we know that these molecules are going in the brain. So what we scientists are doing, they are actually, you know, they are encapsulating, they are, you know, they have a drug, so on the surface of the drug, they put these molecules. So they are befooling the brain, you know, the brain is thinking that it's my own molecules, let them come in. But within them, there's a hidden another thing, that's a drug. So this is called molecular corrosion forces, and we, we often use it in the drug delivery system. Now, when I joined the lab, uh, because my PhD was mostly focused on the drug delivery to the tumor tissues, so I just went after my PhD, I went for a postdoc at Oxford University, so this was my supervisor, Matthew Wood. So he has actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, developed a unique methodology, that's why he got, that paper got published in the Nature Biotech, which is one of the best, you know, uh, So I just joined this lab, so when I joined the lab, they have developed a concept. The concept is, how to deliver a drug in the brain using these extracellular vesicles. But that, that concept was highly immature. So when I joined, he immediately gave me a task. He said that your job is to, de to develop a method so that you can de you know, deliver the drug in the brain. So that was my project when I joined the lab. <laughs> so I have a two, two uh, objectives to cover in that project. One was I have to develop a methodology. So that methodology should be able to take the drugs inside these <laughs> vesicles, please uh, remember that these vesicles are called extracellular vesicles. Then my second task was, these vesicles you have to inject them in the blood and then they should cross the blood brain barrier, they should go in the brain. So that was my project when I joined there. So again, I, I thought of the same thing, I thought let me develop the molecular trojan horses, you know, so use the same strategy. So this is the lipid, this is the, you know, cartoon diagram of the vesicles that I introduced to you. So what I thought, I thought, okay, if I just put on the surface of these vesicles a protein or any other molecule which a brain knows. So I will just, you know, decorate them with that molecule and inside of these vesicles I will put a drug. 
So when the vesicles are going inside, they will be easily you know, taken in the brain, because that's the valve. So for that, I was just searching for a molecule which a brain knows, you know. So I, I came across with a protein that's called lactoferrin. So lactoferrin, we all know that, it's a milk protein. You know? But this lactoferrin, its major job is to carry the iron. It's an iron transporting protein. So in, in the babies, uh, you know, they have a lactoferrin, so they, that helps the babies to take the iron for their own body. But this lactoferrin, it has the other roles. It's a multifunctional protein. Now, recently it has been found that this lactoferrin is also going in the brain. It has a receptor in the brain, so it is taking up efficiently by the brain. And second reason why I looked for this protein, it was a human protein. Because at the end, my aim was to develop a method or drug for the human. Because we are facing the disease. So lactoferrin being a human protein, I thought it will not be, you know, uh, recognized by the immune system as a foreign. So to just, you know, avoid the activation of the immune system, I use the lactoferrin. But here I had an issue. The issue was this. The lactoferrin does not have a membrane binding domain. So people who have this study a little bit about the proteins, we know that there are two types of proteins. One is called the extrinsic proteins which bind on the outer side of the lipid, uh, sorry, plasma membrane, we are the integral proteins. So integral proteins, they do have a lipid domain, which will insert in the plasma membrane. Now this lactoferrin doesn't have it, so it will not bind. So I tell of alternate strategy. What was the strategy? I use another protein that's called lamp UV protein. So this is the lysosomal protein. It's mostly present on our cell surface. And it has the it has the membrane domain. So I attached this lactoferrin on the uh, lamp ruby. This is called in, in, in molecular biology we call these as fusion proteins or recombinant proteins, right? So please do remember here because I, I need this again. So just the concluding is this: the lactoferrin itself doesn't bind to the EV surface. It needs the lamp ruby. This is very important for me. So I developed the concept. I started working, I went to the lab, designed everything that I need for this. But when I was doing this, I found something very unusual. There was some hidden guy sitting here who doesn't like a marriage between the lactoferrin and the lamp ruby. He just cut it. So this, I mean, this is the result here. So basically, in simple terms, I found that the lactoferrin has got cleaved from the lamp ruby. Who cleaved it? No idea. It was a surprising for me. But my job was to develop a drug, and I faced the first obstacle. This is how, you know, I mean. But there was another thing that I, I come across to it. Before discussing that, I will give a simple, again, uh, basic biology. So we, we, people who know a little bit about the chromatography, we have a one kind of chromatography called site exclusion chromatography. So chromatography is used by, you know, by, by, by the life science people to separate the bigger molecules from the smaller molecules. So this chromatography here, it has a beads, so those beads, they allow the bigger molecules to come first, then the smaller molecules come the, the later on. So this is how you can, you can use this uh, method to isolate the biological molecules based on the size. Now in, imagine here, because I told you that exosomes, they are much bigger particles, right? Much bigger than the proteins. So when the exosomes you induce here, the exosomes will come first, then the proteins will come second. It's, it's very simple. But what I found, I found this lactoferrin, it was coming with the exosome. It was not coming with the protein peak, it was coming with the exosome. Now, this was again a surprise for me. I thought, okay, if the lactoferrin is going to be used, it should be with these proteins. So it was not with, with its own family, it was with the exosome family. So again, a problem for me. So there were two questions that I have, I faced, two obstacles. So one was, how is this lactoferrin getting cleaned? So who is the person who, or sorry, who is the agent who is cleaning this lactoferrin? The second question was, if the lactoferrin is cleaned, it should no longer be with the EV, because it is EV only because of the lactoferrin. So these, so I went to my supervisor, I said, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm facing these two problems. 
I cannot tell our method to tell about a drug. Can you allow me to solve these two problems? So because you know, in UK you have a freedom to be independent. So I went with this. Yeah, I solved this problem. So this was basically one of the enzymes that we call the MMP2, matrix metalloprotein. So I will not go into detail of this, how I do that. So then the second problem which I discussed, that if the lactose print is getting clean, how it is still associated. So for that, what I did, so there are two options, obviously. Now, if the lactose print, the liquid lactose print is within the EVs, it could be either inside the EVs or it could be on the outside the EVs, but there is some factor which is holding it on the EV surface. So to prove which one is correct, I developed a method. So what I did, basically, because lactose print is a protein, so I made two conditions. In one condition, I add the protease enzyme. So protease is the enzyme which cleaves the protein. So in this case, I made these membrane intact because this protease cannot go inside because the membrane is intact. So all the proteins which are present on the outside, they will be cleaved. But the protein which are inside, they will not be cleaved. Now in the second case, I made pores inside these uh, vesicles so that Protease, it enters inside, it cleaves everything, inside as well as outside. Now when I saw the result of these two, I found actually the lactoferrin was present on outside, not inside. Okay, that was the problem, you know, I solved it. Now when the lactoferrin is on the outside, it must have some another factor which is bound to it. You know, there should be someone which is helping you to bind on the outside. So at that time, I was lucky because when I was trying to solve the puzzle, there was a paper from the Intech Chindigar. So there was, he's a director right now. So he, he published a paper which actually was a, you know, a, a part of my puzzle. He, he, he actually demonstrated that he has a protein called the gap DH. Students who you know, gap take the glycolytic protein, people who have read the glycolysis, it is a limiting enzyme here. So, but it has the other functions as well. So they found the gap pH is actually interacting with the lactoferrin. So then I got a question, is it not a gap pH here, which is helping the lactoferrin to bind on the outer surface? I designed several experiments, so I will not go in detail because of the lack of time or you will not understand here. Uh, this one is too much. So this is called the co-immunoprecipitation method. So this you can find the unknown protein. And using this technology, I found that it was a gap pH protein which was helping the lactoferrin to remain on the EV surface even if it is getting clean. Now when I just found this, because my aim was to develop a method to deliver drugs, I got excited, okay, I thought, okay, the lactoferrin is getting, you know, it, if, you, if you just have a lactoferrin, it binds on the outer surface of EV through gap pH. Now gap pH is naturally present there. I developed a project, I thought, is it possible if I attach a drug to the lactoferrin, because lactoferrin will easily bind to the EVs. So indirectly you are loading drugs on the EV surface, that was my first job if you remember in the project. So I developed this concept, it worked really well, but the problem was this, I was not able to load too much drug on it. Why? Because there was not much enough gap pH present on the EV surface. So I thought, can I just enhance the you know, more gap pH, can I put more gap pH so that you will have more lactoferrin binding. I added gap pH. But you know, I got very some second important, you know, setback or a puzzle. So when I went to the electron microscopy, because you had to do a microscopy here to just see the vesicles. So the upper ones are the electron microscopic image of these vesicles when they have been done nothing. So when I added the gap pH, I got a puzzling result. All these exosomes or the vesicles, they are just getting a long chain in presence of gap pH. So again, it was a puzzle for me. I don't know what's happening. I thought, okay, let me check if I can understand what's going on. So again, I paused the experiment. I tried to solve what's going on here. So to, for that, I review a literature. I found a paper from the Japanese group. So in Japan, there was a work research lab. So they were, this is how a science can be done. You know, because the talk is much relevant to the students. So if you do the science, uh, you can just get a help from different papers. So this lab, they have a completely different objective. They were working on patients which have an autoimmune disorder. So what were they doing basically? They took a serum from patient which they call as K199. So they were studying the nuclear membrane formation. How the nuclear membrane is formed. 
So in that case, if you see the uh, diagram B here, so if, if you see this, uh, the first row, which is written as TDS, so this is the nuclear membrane getting formed. So when they add the TDS, there's a complete formation of the nuclear membrane. When they add the normal serum, normal serum means the people from the nuclear chamber uh, throughout this disease, there was a nuclear membrane formation going on. But when they add the serum from these patients, the nuclear membrane was not formed properly. And when they did the more research on it, they found basically there were antibodies present in the patients. So those antibodies were binding to the gap gauge. So they found another function of gap gauge. So what is the another function of gap gauge? So it is the it helps us in the formation of the nuclear membrane. Now how it is being formed, it has been proposed that basically when the cell division is going on, the nuclear membrane breaks into small vesicles. So these vesicles, they remain attached at the tip of the chromosome. When there's again Should nuclear membrane formation, these Should small vesicles come together, they form a bigger membrane. And the fusion of these vesicles is mediated by the gap gauge. So I thought, basically, I got the same result as this. I thought maybe the fusion of these vesicles is mediated by the gap gauge. So for that, I went, uh, uh, he was a neighbor there, so he's, he's a, he was working on the fruit fly, Drosophila lab, so he was a well expert, uh, expert. I discussed my result with him, I thought, can we have a collaboration to understand what's going on? So he agreed, and uh, she was a postdoc working in his lab. So he, he worked on the Drosophila, on the, male, on the male testes of the Drosophila. So this Drosophila male, it has a very unique kind of characteristics. It has the cells, which you can see here. These cells, they are much, much bigger. So these cells, they are really big. You can easily see, uh, the, you know, uh, you can easily study uh, what's going on inside of these cells because they are high, much, much bigger than the cells. So we use this model. In this model, what we did basically, and the second advantage was this, because this was a gland. So if the EVs are secreted, you can count the EVs with this one. Now we use a system that is called a gal pole system. So basically what we are doing, we are actually trying to see if we overexpress the gap pH or suppress the gap pH inside of these uh, you know, uh, live insects, what will happen to the EVs. So we, we carry on this experiment. If you need the detail, I can give later on because it's, it's a too much for me. So gal pole is basically it's an activator of a gene that has been taken from the east. So it's working in the east, but it has been put in the Drosophila system to make different kind of cell lines or the, uh, these lines. So when what, in this experiment, what we did basically, we did two situations. In one situation, we suppressed the gap pH. We want to know the role of gap pH in the EV formation. So this is the diagram, if you can see here. These are the cells. So if you see this is the control, now in these cells, we, we just silenced this gap pH and we found a lot of EVs are getting stuck when, when we silence the gap pH. Now if you, if you just overexpose the gap pH, the, the EVs will be released. So the nutshell of this experiment was this, the gap pH was helping in the formation of the EVs inside the cells. We also counted and we found the same result. If you, if, if you knock down the gap pH, you have less number of EVs being secreted by the cells. Now, to just confirm whether it is uh, because of the gap pH or because of the energy crisis, we know the gap pH has a very important role to form the ATP. Now, because ATP are needed for all of this process, we also silence the other enzymes of the glycolytic uh, pathway, but we found that these were not, you know, I mean, the, the phenomena was not repeated if we silence these two enzymes. So the conclusion of this slide is the gap TH has additional function apart from it is like a role and the function was how to release the EVs outside the cells. Now, again coming back because I know the gap TH is binding, so based on this I developed a methodology to load the drugs using the gap TH now. So this is the result that we got in the mice. So we use a hundred pen disease. So hundred pen is a mice model which we use, and we developed a methodology, and we were able to silence the genes inside the brain. So this result uh, we published in the major communication uh, recently. Uh, all these uh, results, and based on that, I, I, I am currently having two research grants. So one is from the GST. 
I am just trying to see the role of the gamete in the suppression of the immune response in the cancer patients. And also I have a... So this growth, basically when I came back to, you know, to Kashmir, I found a lot of people were having the thyroid disorders. So I think each and every family was having two to three people who were having the thyroid. So I thought to work on this as well. So I developed another project to look what is the role of this, why we are in Kashmir, why we are having so many thyroid patients. Now even I have seen, I have met the doctors here, they are saying that the simple prescription they give, they give the tablets, but that is not the solution. We have to find the root cause. So I am working mostly on the salt, basically, because uh, we have done the study and we have found the Kashmiri, they took access to the salt. And I, I have a hypothesis that it's because of the excessive intake of salt, we are developing hypothyroidism as well. So currently I am working with this in collaboration with the skills and, and inshallah by next year we may have some data. So with this, uh, I thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for this outstanding lecture. As I already told you that Dr. Hassan has done cutting edge research. Sir, uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. It was quite new research. Some drugs require ATP systems, like uh, uh, this Pentop D. And some drugs, like um, SLRP, uh, that does not require the ATP system. That is in the form of diffusion, diffusion system. So what is the difference in that? So uh, basically, uh, this is a different... Uh, this this is different. actually uh, some drugs, because uh, rosovastin, we take the rosovastin. I was actually looking for it and took some uh, research from the Lancet. I, I, got, your, I got your question. Uh, uh, basically, what I am saying that, that what I have actually uh, do the presentation is not really with the question. Yes, yes. Basically, in our cells, we have a transporters called ABC transporters. Yes. So those ABC transporters, their main job is to remove everything which is foreign. Yes. That's a protective system. So they are ATP dependent. Yes. So most of the drugs you will see that when we take, their concentration in the blood decreases tremendously. So they, it is done by these receptors. So they just throw the drug out from the cells. That's, that's the simplest way. Now some drugs, you know, I mean, if they activate this this transport system much efficiently, that's why they know they don't they are not much effective because their concentration drops very well within nanoseconds. But some drugs they are not able to activate those transporters very well. That's why you need to remove all the drugs from that those kind of things. Sir, I have a question. Generally, we give glycerol to. भाई मैं यूज कर लो बहुड़ी लेंस साफ करने के लिए कर दूँ मैं यहाँ पर किसी को पॉर्टम था नहीं हाँ यूट्यूब चैनल जीडीसी बॉयज अनंत था सर्च कर लो ये है ना पहली वाली ये लाइव दिखा रहा है ना लाइव नीचे 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 � Encapsulate the drugs. Someone cannot have the base here. No, we cannot. The reason is because the crystal also have a base here. We just give it in the in the in the in the blood. It just comes off separate easily from the drug. It's not binding strongly with the drug. That's the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for being here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
प्रोग्राम कोऑर्डिनेटर विज्ञान प्रसार डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी न्यू दिल्ली मिस्टर रईस इज एन एक्सेप्शनल साइंस राइटर एंड इनोवेटर इज आल्सो मोटिवेशनल स्पीकर ही वाज सपोज्ड टू डिलीवर हिज कीनोट लेक्चर टुडे बट ड्यू टू सम इंपॉर्टेंट इंस्टीट्यूशनल असाइनमेंट्स ही विल नॉट बी अवेलेबल विद अस टुडे हाउएवर we have a video is for you पाद कर